This video does not provide legal opinions or legal advice and is not intended to serve as a substitute for the advice of licensed legal professionals. Neither Arizona Superior Court in Yavapai County nor the authors are engaged in rendering legal, accounting, or other professional services through this video. Arizona Superior Court in Yavapai County and the authors do not warrant that the information herein is complete or accurate and do not assume and hereby disclaim any liability to any person for any loss or damage caused by errors, inaccuracies, or omissions that may appear in this video. Laws and interpretations of laws change frequently, and the material contained in this video carries with it important legal consequences. Users of this video are solely responsible for determining the applicability of any information contained in this video to their situation and are strongly encouraged to seek professional legal and other expert assistance in resolving their parenting issues. This video reflects the process of dissolution of marriage, separation and mediation in Yavapai County. While processes are very similar throughout the state of Arizona, it is a good idea to check with your local county family court to ensure you are following the process required in your county. Hello and welcome to the Parent Education Program. This program is designed to help you and your children navigate the domestic relations process with ease. Throughout this video, my colleagues and I will be sharing helpful ideas and information that will not only be helpful to you, but to your children as well. We will discuss things like common reactions by children and parents to dissolutions and separation, options available as alternatives to dissolution, the legal process for dissolving a marriage, mediation, and parenting plans, communication and co-parenting skills, and basic Arizona Family Court and Domestic Relations Court procedures. You may want to have a pen and pencil ready to take notes. I will check back with you throughout the video and ask you a few questions. We are confident the information you are about to receive will be helpful to your family in the days, months, and years to come. While your relationship with the other parent of your child or children is changing, the relationship you create now is extremely important because your child or children will keep you in contact well past their 18th birthday. In fact, you will need to have a positive contact with the other parent for the rest of your lives. The information you receive today is designed to assist you begin that process. Thank you for your participation. In 1973, Arizona became a no-fault divorce state, meaning that if one person in a marriage feels the marriage is irretrievably broken, they can file for a dissolution of marriage, and they do not have to prove fault by the other party. Prior to 1973, a person would have to prove things like adultery, a prison confinement, cruelty, or abandonment to have a divorce granted. This process was very adversarial and caused a lot of conflict between the parties. While the legal process evolved, it became the increasingly hard on the children involved as they were often put in the position of picking sides and on occasion forced to testify against one parent or the other. Over time, the courts began to realize they had no way of knowing the children in these cases as well as their parents know them. The court started to ask, how can we help families through the dissolution and separation process, doing as little damage as possible to the children? Input was sought from judges, attorneys, doctors, nurses, school personnel, counselors, therapists and researchers, and information was collected to answer that very question. Today, you will have the benefit of learning what those professionals learned. It is a common sense approach. Many of the things you will hear today, you may already know, but we hope that you will hear some new helpful ideas and that you will be reminded of other things that will help you and your children. I wish it wasn't 
too hard to go through. Really hard. It's hard though to see him like this and to see all the things that he's done, but I still love him no matter what. I always will. It's really weird because you don't know when you're going to see them or stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard sometimes, but, you know. good it's like a complete mystery to me like half of my life is like disappeared like I don't know what happened this can be a stressful time of life and a dissolution of marriage can have a devastating effect on children but it doesn't have to ruin their lives picture your child's high school graduation their wedding or the birth of your first grandchild how do you want your children to feel on those very special days of their lives do you want them to feel love and respect for you and for themselves? Or do you want them to feel confused and bitter because that's what they have seen in their parents? The decision is in your hands. Though you and your spouse are divorcing each other, you are not divorcing your children. Your children need to know what, that they are loved and will not be abandoned. Here are some general guidelines for divorcing parents. We will elaborate more on each topic throughout this video. So here are some things that parents should do. Do tell your children about the divorce together, if possible. Do answer your children's questions honestly while avoiding unnecessary details. Do reassure your children they are not to blame for the divorce. Do tell your children they are loved and will be taken care of. Do include the other parent in school and other activities. Do encourage the relationship between your children and the other parent. Do be consistent and be on time to pick up and return your children. Do develop a workable parenting plan that gives your children access to both parents. Do try to avoid canceling plans with your children. Do establish two homes for your children with two fully involved parents. Do give your children permission to have a loving, satisfying relationship with the other parent. And here are some things parents should not do. Don't try to obtain information about the other parent from your children. Don't try to control the other parent. Don't use the children to carry messages back and forth. Don't argue in front of your children. Don't discuss child support issues with your children. Don't put your children in the position of having to take sides. Don't use your children to hurt the other parent. If you're watching this video, chances are you've made the decision to go forward with the dissolution of your marriage or legal separation. But I want to let you know about another option. The superior courts in the state of Arizona have what is known as conciliation services. You don't need to have filed a case in order to take advantage of these services. You simply file a request for conciliation counseling at your local clerk's office and you'll be given the opportunity to sit down with the other party and a licensed conciliation counselor to explore the possibilities of reconciliation. While it is not mandatory that the parties reconcile, if one party or the other makes a request for conciliation, that request will be considered by the court. Rule 68 of the Arizona Rules of Family Law Procedure allows for the possibility of extending the court proceedings for up to 120 days so that the parties may attempt reconciliation or counseling. However, it may not be granted if the other party objects with good cause. And of course, families always have the option to obtain counseling outside of the court system to strengthen or improve your marriage or relationship. You can hire a professional counselor or therapist or look for resources in your community. Many churches, synagogues, and other places of worship have counselors available as well. 
If they do not have staff on hand to help, they can usually help with a referral. Another alternative to a dissolution of marriage is a legal separation. There are certain findings the court must make in order to issue a decree in a legal separation. Those findings include that the marriage is irretrievably broken or that one or both of the parties wants to live separate and apart and that the other party does not object to a decree of legal separation. If the other party objects to a decree of legal separation, the case will be changed to a dissolution case. A legal separation is a proceeding that will result in court orders about property, children, and parenting time. People sometimes choose a legal separation for religious or personal reasons or the ability to stay on the spouse's insurance. Legal separation stops the community, meaning that just as with a dissolution of marriage, after a petition for legal separation has been served, you are not responsible for the other person's new debt, and you have no right to any property they acquire, and vice versa. A legal separation decree can be undone or changed to a dissolution by a court order in the future. A legal separation does not end the marriage. Can you name at least one alternative to a dissolution of marriage? If you said conciliation or legal separation, you're right. This dissolution process will require you to attend one or more hearings in the coming months. Let's get acquainted with the courtroom, the staff, and the proper etiquette you should exhibit while you are there. When you enter the courtroom, you're likely to first see the bailiff. The bailiff assists the judge by maintaining order in the courtroom and sometimes assists with exhibits and paperwork. The bailiff will ask you to please rise or stand when the judge enters and exits the courtroom. The next person you will encounter is the courtroom clerk. The clerk sits to the side of the judge in the courtroom and is responsible for taking notes during the hearing and preparing minute entries or documents that will be kept in your main file at the courthouse. Both parties in the matter will also receive copies of the prepared minute entries, either electronically or by mail. In many courtrooms, you will also see a court reporter. The court reporter sits in front of the judge's bench and uses a machine called a stenographer machine. The job of the court reporter is to record every spoken word in a hearing and prepare a transcript of everything that is said. You may purchase a copy of the transcript of your hearing by contacting the court reporter in your matter. In some courtrooms, you may not see a court reporter, but instead, you're in a courtroom that has an electronic recording system that records every spoken word of your hearing digitally. It is also possible to purchase a CD of your hearing in such courtrooms. Finally, you will see the judge. The judge is responsible for taking testimony in your case and making rulings on individual matters raised, as well as making decisions about the case in general. It is important to address the judge as judge or your honor when speaking to the judge. You will not be permitted to have individual private meetings with the judge at any point in your case. Just as you would not want the other party to be able to speak to the judge about you, you are also not permitted to speak to the judge about the other party. Finally, there is one more important person you are likely to have contact with during this process. That's the judicial assistant. While the judicial assistant is not usually in the courtroom, you're likely to have telephone contact at some point with the JA for purposes of scheduling or if you have questions regarding your case. While the JA cannot give you legal advice, they can help point you in the right direction to get the answer you need. Remember, the JA cannot talk to the judge for you or relay information, but they can most certainly help with general questions about your case. Now we will talk about the process for dissolution of marriage. You are either the petitioner or the respondent in this matter. The only difference between the two is the petitioner is the person who filed a petition first. There is no advantage or disadvantage to being either petitioner or respondent unless the parties reside in different counties. The statute states that a petition for dissolution of marriage is filed in the county in which the petitioner resides. So if the parties reside in different counties, it matters who files first in that situation. 
Before filing a petition for dissolution of marriage, it is required that you have been a resident of Arizona for more than 90 days. If you have, then you may file. Once the petition is filed, you will need to serve the petition on the other party or get an acceptance of service. You will have 120 days to complete service. If you are not able to get assigned acceptance of service from the other party, you can have the sheriff in your county serve the other party. You can pay a private process server or you can send the document via United Parcel Service or FedEx so long as someone signs for the package. The respondent then has 20 days to file a response if the petition was served in the state of Arizona and 30 days to file a response if the petition was served outside the state of Arizona. At this point, there are three different ways your case could proceed. Number one, if both parties agree on all aspects of the dissolution, have a signed and notarized agreement, have attended parent education, and have filed a child support worksheet, it is possible for the case to move forward to a consent decree. This means that after a 60-day period, if all documents have been filed and the judge agrees, a consent decree can be signed and the matter is complete. Number two, if no response is filed within 20 to 30 days, the petitioner may then file for what is called a default. Then, if no response is filed within 10 days, the petitioner can submit a decree of dissolution. Once the documents are in order, the parent education class has been taken, and all fees have been addressed, either paid or deferred, the matter will be set for a default hearing. At the default hearing, the judge will enter a final decree of dissolution. And finally, number three. If a response is filed within the initial 20 to 30 day period and the matter is contested by the respondent, the case will be assigned to a judge and the matter will be set for a resolution management conference within 30 to 45 days. If children are involved, the judge may order the parties to participate in mediation. We will talk about mediation a little later in the video. Once the mediation process is complete, the matter will be set for a comprehensive pretrial conference and, if needed, a trial. After the trial, the judge will make orders and enter a final decree at this stage. Name three ways your case may proceed through the court. Consent, default, or trial. A less common type of marriage is called a covenant marriage. If you are not familiar with this term, chances are you do not have a covenant marriage. A covenant marriage is a separate agreement that you enter into at the time you get married. It contains certain provisions, such as the parties agree not to get divorced until after attending counseling for at least six months. There are a number of conditions and limitations on the scenarios in which you may file for a dissolution of marriage when you have a covenant marriage. When a petition for dissolution is filed, one of the documents that is required is a preliminary injunction. A preliminary injunction lists specific things that neither party can do. For example, you may not hide earnings or community property from your spouse. You may not take out a loan on community property. You may not sell or give away community property. You are not to harass or bother your spouse or the children, and both parties must maintain all insurance coverage in full force and effect. Make sure that you carefully read through the preliminary injunction so that you will know what is expected of you during the dissolution proceedings. Violating the preliminary injunction could result in an order of contempt of court. So we have already mentioned that while in the courtroom, you should address the judge as judge or your honor. But let's talk about some other behaviors that can be helpful while in the courtroom. While everyone knows this can be a highly emotional time, it's important to keep your emotions in check while in the courtroom. You're likely to hear things with which you do not agree. You may hear something you believe is a lie. 
And while the inclination to roll your eyes or shake your head or speak out of turn might be great, be sure that you don't. You want to keep a poker face during your proceedings. If you have an attorney, trust your attorney to stand up for you. If you are representing yourself, remember not to argue. Do not argue with a witness, with the other party, and most of all, do not argue with the judge. And don't bring a fan club to your hearings. It's not a good idea to bring a ton of friends and family to your hearing as support. If you want to ask one close friend or one parent to come with you to help support you emotionally, that is okay. But make sure they understand that they also cannot roll their eyes, shake their head, or antagonize the other party in the matter. And if you are in a new relationship, it's not the best idea to bring the new partner to your dissolution proceedings. Imagine how you would feel if your ex brought their significant other to the hearing. If you have an attorney, make sure you meet with your attorney before the hearing so that you will know the plan ahead of time. While the hearing is taking place, you do not want to be talking in your attorney's ear the entire time, objecting to things that are said, or giving your attorney helpful hints on what to say next. If you have an item you want discussed, simply write it on a piece of paper and slide it over to your attorney. Be prepared for your day in court. Make sure you have your documentation in order and any notes you need as a reminder. On the day of your hearing, make sure you arrive at least 15 minutes early. It is a safe bet that it may take some time to find a parking space. Remember that you will have to go through security and there can be a line there as well. You will want to make sure your cell phone is completely turned off before you enter the courtroom. Remember to speak respectfully to everyone with whom you come in contact and be ready to compromise and negotiate. Be professional throughout your hearing in front of the judge and this includes professional attire. Do not wear t-shirts, shorts, or anything that shows too much of your body when attending your hearing. Dress appropriately and do not wear anything that can be a distraction. Make sure you spit out your gum and that you are not wearing a hat or sunglasses on your head. In most cases involving children, the judge will order you to attend mediation. Mediation is a process in which you and the other party in the matter will be able to sit down and create a parenting plan for your children. There is no additional cost for mediation when you are creating a parenting plan. You and the other party will sit down with one or two mediators for up to four hours. The mediator will not give you legal advice or make recommendations about your parenting plan. They are there to guide you through a plan that you and the other party create for yourself. They can give ideas about what other parties have tried and various options, but they will not endorse one idea over another. Mediation is a confidential process. This means that you are free to discuss whatever you need to discuss in mediation without fear that it will be used against you in court. The mediators cannot discuss what is said in mediation to the judge in your case, and parties are asked to keep the information given in mediation confidential as well. This means you can't discuss what is said with friends, family, or your significant other. And since mediation is confidential, mediators and participants may not testify about what happens in mediation. So who can attend mediation? Generally, mediation takes place between the parents involved in the case. On occasion, attorneys will attend mediation as well. Attorneys can be an asset in mediation as they can help answer questions for their clients throughout the process or during a break. But for the most part, they do not take an active role in the mediation process as it is a helpful for the mediators to hear directly from the parents what kind of parenting plan they would like to make. Your children are not permitted in mediation. You cannot bring friends or family members or new significant others. So once mediation is complete, if an agreement is reached, that agreement will be sent to your judge for final approval. If no agreement is reached in mediation, the judge is simply made aware that no agreement was reached, but is not given any details as to why. This helps ensure the confidentiality of the mediation. So what exactly is a parenting plan? 
A parenting plan is a document that spells out which parent your child will be with at any given time. It is a detailed document that covers everything from the day-to-day -day plan to holidays, breaks, travel, legal decision-making, and parental access to records. Written parenting plans provide children and parents with predictability and consistency and can prevent future conflict. Courts prefer that parents reach agreements about parenting time. When parents reach agreements, they are more likely to cooperate as their children grow up. Children do their best when parents cooperate with each other. The reverse is also true. Children who experience ongoing conflict between parents are at high risk for suffering serious long-term emotional problems. You will be able to create a parenting plan with the help of a mediator, or you and the other party may create one together and submit it to the court. Keep in mind that whether you create a parenting plan in mediation or on your own, the plan should be detailed enough that a stranger could read it and know exactly which parent your child should be with and when. The parenting plan will also include a statement about legal decision making. In Arizona, parents may have sole or joint legal decision making. Parents may agree that one parent will have sole legal decision making or that joint legal decision making is in their children's best interests. A parent who has sole legal decision making has the right to make major decisions about the children's health, education, and religious upbringing. Parents who have joint legal decision making make such decisions together, unless otherwise specified. Parents with joint legal decision making do not necessarily have equal parenting time. The key to successful co-parenting is a written parenting plan that states the agreements parents reach about legal decision making, the sharing of rights and privileges, and the schedule for parenting time. In Arizona, joint decision making requires a written parenting plan that must be reviewed periodically and provides a way to resolve conflicts about legal decision making and parenting time. The parenting plan also must include a statement that joint legal decision making does not necessarily mean equal parenting time. There are many issues or questions you should consider before creating the parenting plan. For example, how old are our children? How mature are our children? What are our children's personalities like? Do the children or parents have any special needs? What are the children's relationships with siblings and friends? Are the parents' homes too far apart to maintain regular and frequent contact? How flexible are the parents' and the children's schedules? What child care arrangements are needed? How and where will exchanges take place? How will transportation be provided? How well can the parents communicate and cooperate? What are the children's and the parents' cultural and religious practices? The bulk of your parenting plan will determine scheduled parenting time. This means your day-to-day -day plan that includes weekdays, weeknights, and weekends. Parents are encouraged to make plans that are as detailed as possible to avoid confusion. Daily schedules should include the time and place of the exchange and the days or days of the week that the exchanges will occur. The schedule for holidays, vacations, and school breaks takes priority over the regularly scheduled parenting time. In deciding how to schedule these events, think about it from your child's point of view. Children enjoy having the opportunity to have special time with each parent and extended family members. Each parent may need to encourage his or her extended family to adjust some of their schedules so the child can participate in celebrations during parenting time. Also, think about the child's need to have contact with the other parent during extended vacation time. Scheduled phone calls during a vacation can help reduce anxiety for both the parent and the child without disrupting the vacation. Whenever the child will be traveling to a different place, the court expects parents to share information about where they will be staying, how they can be contacted, and when they will be returning. If the vacationing parent provides a written schedule that includes this information, the non-vacationing parent will be assured of the ability to communicate in case of an emergency. 
In that same way, the non-vacationing parent should provide contact information if he or she will not be at home during the child's vacation. In determining what to do about school breaks, consider the child's activities and the availability of one or both parents during the break. If the child needs daycare, the parents can consider a plan that minimizes daycare during the break. If both parents must work, the child may still enjoy a break from the regular schedule that allows him or her to spend more time with the parent than is usual. The first step is to decide what holidays either of you wish to celebrate. Keep in mind the traditions the child has experienced through his or her own life and how the holiday parenting time might affect these traditions and the child's security. Children thrive on the healthy traditions and celebrations and respond more enthusiastically to a plan when both parents work on it together and support it. After you decide which holidays apply, Think about whether all holidays should be handled the same way or whether it makes more sense to divide some and alternate some. Many parents agree that children will be with the mother every Mother's Day and the father every Father's Day. Many parents divide most of the holidays but split up the time on days that are special for both parents such as Christmas Eve and Christmas Day or the child's birthday. Most parents agree to a set time for each parent to enjoy a vacation with the child. Whether you are traveling for vacation or just staying home, your child will enjoy spending any time you can take away from work with you. Whether a parent has the ability to take time off from work, vacation parenting time is intended to allow each parent the chance to either travel or stay home and spend an uninterrupted period of time with their child. A child may become anxious if away from a parent for much longer than usual. Scheduling a phone call midway through a week-long vacation, for instance, may help the child handle the separation. Sometimes frequent calls from the away parent can cause the child to feel sadness and longing. If both parents are sensitive to the needs of their child, they can find a balance between no contact and too much contact. If a long vacation period is going to be spent at home or close to home, it might make sense to break it up with a short visit with the other parent. Parents need to make all of these decisions ahead of time to reduce conflict between them and to provide predictability for the child. Because transportation, weather, and other issues can cause problems during travel, it is important to provide the other parent with details about when and where travel will occur. Details include flight numbers and times, hotels, places where the child will be staying, and telephone numbers. If an emergency arises, a parent should be able to contact the other parent or the child. The parent traveling with the child should have passports, travel documentation, including a notarized consent to travel form if traveling outside the United States, updated medical information, insurance cards, prescriptions, and any other special supplies the child will need. Communication about when each parent will use vacation time needs to take place well in advance of the vacation. Because of school schedules, most parents plan vacations in the summer and will often set a deadline to communicate the dates of their vacations. For instance, if each parent has a two-week period, they may decide that in evening years, Parent A will have their first chance to choose the vacation dates and must communicate those dates in writing by April 1. Parent B will then choose the vacation dates out of the remaining dates and communicate those days in writing by April 15. In this example, Parent B would have first choice in odd numbered years. School districts will determine the break schedule and usually publish their yearly calendars well in advance. Most districts have websites that provide current schedules. As with holidays, the first step is to determine which breaks the school observes. Schools may have spring, summer, fall, and winter breaks, as well as early release or other school release days. 
If the parents have a regular parenting time schedule with nearly equal time, many parents will not change the parenting time schedule during the school breaks. The regular schedule will continue. Other parents will decide to alternate breaks each year or share the break by splitting the time between each parent. Since the breaks sometimes occur at the same time as the holidays, such as Christmas or Passover and Easter, it may be helpful to look at the holiday schedule at the same time when planning the break schedule. Another great support system throughout this process can be extended family, both maternal and paternal sides of the family. Your children will benefit greatly from having strong relationships with all of their family members. Traditions can continue and even new traditions can be made. Connections with extended family can help children to know where they came from and know more about their family history. Try to have conversations with your extended family about being supportive to your children during this process. Remind them not to tear down the other parent, but instead be a positive, encouraging person in your child's life. We've definitely changed a lot. I know that we've been a lot closer since it. Um, we just know that we need each other and we have to stay together and we're definitely a lot closer. So I really don't remember like having any counseling or going over to friend's house and talking about it. Just remember just me and my sisters were always together. My friend Andrew, uh, when I talk about it, he constantly repeats the phrase, that's depressing. And <laughs> it, it helps because, I mean, it's just a little bit of humor in it that that uh, helps make me laugh and help me kind of uh, be a little bit better with it, I guess. I I turned to my best friend. Her name was Rihanna, and she had a she has a stepdad, and she said her dad did the same thing, and it happened like about the same time. Like we were both sad and upset, and sometimes we were happy, like because we both were going through the same thing. And, I can go to different people for different kinds of help, like I can go to my mom or I can go to my dad and, or even my stepdad or my grandma. It's nice to know that I have, that I do have people in my life and that the people support me. In mediation, you may also discuss the idea of a long distance parenting plan or a possible relocation plan. Parents must be aware of the impact of relocation on their child, and the relocation may require the permission of a judge. Long distance parenting rules can apply whenever the move between homes is more than 100 miles or there is travel between two states. Please read the Arizona Relocation Statute, ARS 25-408, before thinking about a move. That statute permits a long distance move of a child only when the move is in the best interest of the child. The statute can be found in public libraries or on the internet by following the links at www.azleg.state.az.us. Parents often disagree about long distance parenting time. As a result, the judge is required to make a decision. Unfortunately, a decision by a judge may not please either party. Each relocation case is unique and the right decision is based on the specific facts for each family. Parents should make a serious effort to resolve a parenting time dispute themselves or with the help of a mediator or an attorney. Any reasonable agreement between the parents negotiated in good faith is usually better than having a judge decide the matter after the expense and stress of a court hearing. A parent who wants to move a long distance with or without a child should think about many things before making a decision. Long distances often weaken the relationships between children and parents. If the move is necessary, parents might want to consider relocating both households to the same city. If that isn't possible, parenting time for the distant parent must be at regular and frequent times during the year. The court considers many factors, and parents should think about these factors. Each parent should take a moment and stand in the other parent and the child's shoes. What is their point of view? How would I feel if my child moved away to another city? Think about all the facts, including the age and maturity of the child, the child's developmental needs, sibling bonds, school and work schedules, transportation costs, 
the presence of, of supportive family and friends in each city, and the gains or loss of extended family. For most children, a long-distance move may result in less regular contact with both parents. If both parents are within a reasonable distance of each other, the child benefits. When parents live far apart, a child's daily and weekly contact is reduced, and large gaps of time without physical contact between the child and parent develop. When both parents move to the same general area, it's less disruptive. No matter the distance, a child will benefit from as much regular and frequent contact with each parent as possible. When parents live far apart, there should be at least four blocks of parenting time every year. Blocks of time should occur over the summer, winter break, spring break, and at least one other block of time. When the parents live close enough to each other, they can add an additional monthly weekend during the months not covered by the four other parenting time blocks. When the driving distance is under four hours, the opportunity exists to add every other weekend or a long weekend in your plan. Holidays and special occasions are challenging for parents who live far apart. As children reach age three, they become aware of holidays. Parents must be flexible, cooperative, and allow the child to enjoy special times with each parent. New family traditions may develop for each household. Parents should arrange for the many religious, cultural, or national holidays that exist in each home, including family birthdays, Mother's Day, and Father's Day. Long distance parenting is expensive. The cost of travel is covered in the child support guidelines. If the court hasn't said how the travel expenses will be divided, the parents should agree on how to share these costs before a move. In the case where a move is necessary, the cost may be divided in proportion to the parents' incomes. However, if the move is voluntary, the moving parent may find that they pay a greater percentage of all travel costs. A cost-saving idea is to have the distant parent do most of the traveling and not the child. Even though you're separated, I think that both parents should try to be a part of your child's life so that they don't feel like you've completely abandoned them. One thing I really wish I could tell my dad is that to have him move closer to us so he doesn't have to drive. The hardest thing about it all is probably not being able to see my dad just because uh, he would always take me uh, climbing and backpacking and hiking and stuff and I really enjoyed hanging out with him and we can't really do that all that much anymore. As you make your way through the dissolution or separation process, one of the items that will need to be decided is who has legal decision-making authority for the children. Legal decision-making is the status where one or both parents are responsible for making the major decisions regarding the child's care or welfare. When legal decision-making is awarded to one parent, it is called sole legal decision-making. When parents share legal decision-making, it's called joint legal decision-making. Sole legal decision-making means that one parent has the sole legal decision-making over a child. In this situation, the court orders that one parent be responsible for making the major decisions regarding the child's care or welfare. Although both parents may discuss these matters, the parent designated by the court has authority to make final decisions in the event the parents do not agree. The court can also grant joint legal decision-making. When the court grants joint legal decision-making, each of the parents has the same rights to make decisions about the child's care and welfare, and neither parent's rights are superior to those of the other parent. In the best interest of the child, the court may direct that certain decisions be made by only one parent, even though joint legal decision-making is granted. Arizona public policy favors joint legal decision-making. What is the difference between sole legal decision-making and joint legal decision-making? Sole legal decision-making means one parent has the legal right and responsibility to make major decisions for the child. That parent may consult with the other parent before making a decision. Joint legal decision-making means both parents share decision-making and neither parent's rights or responsibilities are superior, except with respect to specified decisions as set forth by the court 
or the parents in the final judgment or order. Next, we will take a look at some of the factors your judge will consider when determining sole or joint legal decision making. And if there is a joint legal decision making, who will be the primary custodial parent? Your judge will take the following items into consideration. What are the wishes of the parents? What are the wishes of the children? Are there things to consider, such as a decision-making study, therapist's opinions or observations, parenting coordinator's opinions or observations, or did the judge interview the children? What are the interaction and interrelations like with parents, extended family, siblings, step-parents, boyfriend and girlfriends, and stepsisters and brothers? What is the child's adjustment to home, school, and community? What is the mental and physical conditions of all individuals involved? Which parent is more likely to allow frequent and meaningful visitation with the other parent? If one, both, or neither parents have been actively parenting the children? Has there been coercion or duress? Are the parents at odds? Have the parents attended the parent education class? Has there been domestic violence or child abuse? Under Arizona law, on reasonable request, both parents are entitled to have equal access to documents and other information concerning the children's education and physical, mental, moral, and emotional health. These records include medical, school, police, court, and other records. A person who does not comply with a reasonable request for these records shall reimburse the requesting parent for any court costs and attorney fees incurred by that parent to make the other parent obey this request. A parent who attempts to restrict the release of documents or information by the custodian of the records without a prior court order is subject to legal sanctions. As you're building your parenting plan, you will notice a statement regarding contact with sex offenders and persons convicted of dangerous crimes against children. This is the list of dangerous crimes against children as defined by Arizona Revised Statute Section In Arizona, you are required by law to notify the other parent in writing if you know that a convicted or registered sex offender or a person who has been convicted of a dangerous crime against children may have access to your children. Arizona Revised Statute Section 25-403.05b reads as follows. A child's parent or custodian must immediately notify the other parent or custodian if the parent or custodian knows that a convicted or registered sex offender or a person who has been convicted of a dangerous crime against children, as defined in Section 13-705, may have access to the child. The parent or custodian must provide notice by first-class mail, return receipt requested, by electronic means to an electronic mail address that the recipient provided to the parent or custodian for notification purposes, or by other communication accepted by the court. This statement, included in the parenting plans in Arizona, your signature on your parenting plan will indicate to the judge that you have read this statement and that you have been made aware of the responsibilities to notify the other parent. True or false? You must immediately notify the other parent in writing if you know that a convicted or registered sex offender or person convicted of a dangerous crime against children may have access to your children. That is true. At some point in this process, you will be asked to provide the court with a child support worksheet. This worksheet will include information such as the children's names and dates of birth, parents' gross income amounts, medical, dental, and vision costs for the children, extra education expenses, parenting time days per year, and if spousal maintenance is paid or received by either parent, and whether court-ordered child support is being paid for children of other relationships. 
These factors and others are taken into consideration when the judge calculates child support. For example, parents may each claim one child or parents may alternate years taking both children. You can find the Arizona Child Support Calculator to help you with these calculations at the Arizona Supreme Court website at www.azcourts.gov. As you fill out your parenting plan, you will want to consider including some or all of the following ideas in your plan. These are general guidelines for effective parenting and can help to build trust and stronger relationships over time. Keep the other parent informed of any changes to your address and or phone number in advance. If you expect a change, let the other parent know in advance. You would be very unhappy if you tried to call the other parent only to find that their phone had been disconnected. It is a matter of courtesy and respect to keep each other informed of current contact information. Promptly inform the other parent of any emergency or other important event that involves your children. Talk with the other parent regarding any activity such as sports, music programs, or appointments that will affect the children's time with the other parent. Consider the other parent as a care provider for the children before making other arrangements. Keep all communications regarding the children between the parents. Do not use the children to pass information or set up parenting time changes. Make sure each parent has telephone contact with the children during the children's normal waking hours. Encourage love and respect between the children and the other parent. Do not say or do anything that may hurt the other parent's relationship with the children, such as talking about the other parent's problems, family members, or financial issues. Agree to make your best efforts to work cooperatively with the best interests of the children in mind and resolve any disagreements that may arise. If either parent moves out of town and returns later you can agree to use the most recent parenting time agreement in place before the move. If due to unforeseen circumstances, either parent is unable to follow through with the parenting time arrangements, you should notify the other parent as soon as possible. If you are unable to reach an agreement with the other party regarding changes, disagreements, or claimed breaches to the parenting time agreement, you can agree to request mediation through conciliation court or a private mediator or counselor. While a disagreement is being resolved, do not deviate from the parenting time agreement already in place. It is a good idea to review your parenting plan with the other parent annually. As your children grow up, their needs and interests will change, and these things can have an effect on the logistics of the parenting plan. An annual review will provide for small adjustments to your plan so that a huge adjustment won't need to be made suddenly. Let's talk a little bit about a child's brain development. A child's brain begins to develop when they are in the womb. The baby starts to attune or match with the mother's heartbeat and create a rhythm. This rhythm is basic to who we are and it stimulates the body. Next, the brain stem begins to develop in the very back of the brain. This is also called the animal brain or the reptilian brain. This part of the brain regulates things like breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure. They are bodily functions that we don't even have to think about. They just automatically happen. Imagine if you had to remind yourself to breathe or tell your heart to beat. It turns out the brain is very efficient and controls so many things automatically. The next part of the brain that develops is the midbrain. Your brain has two hemispheres and contains billions and billions of neurons that are releasing chemicals 
and electrical impulses. You begin to develop basic skills such as ABCs and 123s. Research shows that the brain has the most cells for brain power it will ever have between the ages of two and four years old. After that time, the brain begins to start to be efficient and do a thing called pruning. So if you don't use those brain cells, you will lose them. While the brain is building, there are basically two primary emotions, love and fear. As parents, it is important to understand this concept so that you can focus on building the love emotion in your children. If a child is in constant stress and instability, the fear side will begin to take root. If you are able to foster a safe, caring, and stable environment, your child will be more at ease and able to deal with life in general. Imagine taking a hike in the woods. The first time you take the hike, the path may be rocky and not very well laid down. But day after day, as you take the same hike, you begin to lay down a pathway that is familiar and smooth. The same is true for our brains. Exposure day after day to the same behavior will lay down a pathway in your brain. These either can be positive pathways or negative pathways. Let's take a closer look at the developmental stages of the children. This section will help you understand where a child is now developmentally and what you can expect as they get older. Babies learn quickly. They are learning to love and trust familiar caregivers. Babies become attached to parents and others through consistent, loving responses such as holding, playing, feeding, soothing, talking gently and lovingly stimulating, creating bedtime and bath time routines, and prompt attention to their needs, babies begin to respond to a range of different but equally valuable types of parenting styles that each parent provides. Most parents have different ways of parenting. It's helpful if parents share information about how they're parenting the child and while the child is in their care. In addition, parents need to be sensitive to their baby's emotional reactions, ability to adjust to changes when going from one parent to another and mood. It helps when parents talk about these things when making or changing schedules. Babies can't remember things they experienced over time. In other words, out of sight, out of mind. Therefore, it's important that they have frequent contact with each of their parents and have a stable schedule and routine. On the other hand, babies do have emotional memories of conflict that can have long-term negative effects, so parents shouldn't argue when children, even babies, can hear the arguing. Many babies are sensitive to the tension between the parents at exchange time, so if you can't be pleasant to each other, you may need someone else to help you with the exchange times. At around six months, babies can recognize their parents and caregivers and may become uneasy around strangers. Regular caregivers understand how the child signals the need for food, comfort, and sleep. When away from parents or significant caregivers, babies may become anxious and have eating and sleeping problems. However, being away from one parent or caregiver and in the care of the other parent to whom the child is bonded shouldn't be a problem for most babies. Babies have basic sleep, feeding, and waking schedules. It's important to keep the baby on these schedules. Parents should work out their own plans so they don't interfere with the baby's normal routine. Also in creating parenting plans for this age group, parents ought to think about the special needs of breastfeeding babies. Nursing mothers may want to express milk and send bottles with the baby so the father can feed the baby during his parenting time. One to two year olds are becoming more aware of the world around them and the people who have a lot of contact with them. A baby at this age can be attached to many caregivers including grandparents, extended family members, and daycare providers. Babies are also becoming independent and developing the ability to comfort themselves by thumb sucking or holding on to favorite blankets or toys. Their sleeping and eating schedules are becoming regular. They continue to respond to the different types of nurturing provided by their parents. 
Two-year-olds commonly test parental limits, and consistent and loving parental responses can help the child build self-esteem for years to come. Moving between the parents' homes may be difficult for some youngsters, and they may become upset at these times. For some children, resistance to exchange time is normal. This behavior doesn't necessarily mean that the other parent isn't a good parent or that the child doesn't want to be with the other parent. While parents need to be sensitive to whatever the child is experiencing, most children calm down shortly after the exchange. You can make exchanges easier for your child by following predictable schedules, avoiding conflict with the other parent in front of your child, and supporting your child's relationship with the other parent. Ages two to three are important times for children to develop independent skills. Although children at this age are learning to be independent, they may still cling to their caregiver and resist separation, even from one parent to the other. They may say no to parents' requests and demands just to express their independence. They may also be fearful about unfamiliar activities and objects. Predictability, regular scheduled routines help children manage their fears and help them learn that the world is a safe place. Moving between parents' homes may become difficult for some children at this age, and they may become upset. This behavior doesn't necessarily mean that the other parent isn't a good parent or that the child doesn't want to be with the other parent. Parents must continue to ensure that the transitions between the two parents' homes are free of parental arguing and tension. Three to five-year-olds are attached to their regular caregivers and separation may make them uncomfortable and anxious. They may also be afraid of unfamiliar activities, people and things, and may experience night fears like monsters under the bed. Three to five-year-olds may show increased emotional discomfort when moving between parents' homes. Some of these children may become very upset at these times. This behavior doesn't necessarily mean that the other parent isn't a good parent or that the child doesn't want to be with the other parent. Parents can make exchanges easier for children by following predictable schedules and making sure the child isn't exposed to conflict between the parents. Children are more likely to resist going with the other parent if the parents are tense or hostile or argue with each other at the exchange. If tension is present, the child might become difficult to manage or might act out. If parents can't be nice to each other, or at least civil, they should avoid talking to each other at exchanges. Parents should not use the child as a messenger to communicate with the other parent. Children may also feel more secure if they can take favorite stuffed toys, family photos, or other objects that will remind them of the other parent. After age three, children become more aware of holiday celebrations. Parents should schedule holidays, which may be religious, cultural, or national, that are meaningful to the child and the family. Parents should also include birthdays, Mother's Day, and Father's Day in the parenting plan. Three to five-year-olds may benefit from structured time with children their own age, away from parents. This time helps them develop social skills and learn that they can be safe and happy away from both parents. Six to nine-year-old children may worry that one parent doesn't love them or that they will lose one parent. They may miss the absent parent and feel sad, confused, and angry about their parents' divorce. They also may try to get their parents back together. Some six to nine-year-old children benefit from spending more time at one home while others move back and forth on a regular basis with ease. Children differ in how long they are comfortable being away from each parent. Some may be comfortable being away from the parent with whom the child lives most of the time on a regular basis for two or more days. If the child has spent considerable quality time with the parent who has parenting time, the child may cope better with a long separation from the other parent. As a child matures, longer periods of parenting time with fewer exchanges between parents may be preferred. In making a parenting time schedule, parents should keep their work schedules in mind and try to use their time off from work to spend as much time as possible with the child. If a parent's work schedule changes from week to week,
The parenting plan may let that parent spend time with the child on the parent's days off from work after giving plenty of advance notice to the other parent. 10 to 12 year old children often want to be independent from their parents and are becoming more attached to their friends. They may blame one parent for the divorce, may be angry and be embarrassed by the breakup of the family, and may side with one parent. Children of this age often want to have a say in where they live. Parents should let them express their views while making it clear it is up to the parents to make the final decisions. As children begin junior high or middle school, parents should make sure the parenting plan considers the child's school and extracurricular activities. The parents also should consider the child's desire for an occasional overnight with friends away from both homes. Parents should be flexible while at the same time making sure that each parent has parenting time regularly. The teenager is developing greater independence and beginning to separate from the family, including both parents. Teens start to feel like young adults who think they no longer need their parents, but they also have times when they still want their parents to take care of them. They begin to plan for driving and dating, and they're thinking about college or work. They are feeling the pressures of school, family, and friends, and they may not like a strict parenting time schedule. They may show their dissatisfaction by becoming irritable or moody or having an attitude they never had before. Many lack the skills to express the many strong but conflicting emotions that go along with growing up. When parents are establishing a parenting time schedule for thinking about making changes in an existing schedule, they should give more thought to the needs and wishes of their teenager. Parents should let them express their views while making it clear it is up to the parents to make the final decisions. During a separation or divorce, parents often feel the need to pull their teen closer to them to reassure themselves they aren't losing their child to the other parent. Sometimes parents are tempted to get the child on their side. A teen may avoid both parents or reject one parent and cling to the other, especially if the parents are putting them in the middle of their conflict. Some teens want little or nothing to do with either parent and turn to friends or others to talk to who aren't part of the conflict. Teens are often confused and angry at the way their parents are acting and may feel their parents haven't been concerned about how the divorce is affecting them. The strong conflicting emotions they experience may cause them to act in new and unfamiliar ways as they struggle to deal with these changes in their lives. Therefore, parents shouldn't assume that their child's mood swings are acting out or caused by the other parent. Children between the ages 13 and 15 continue to use the family as a base of support and guidance. This is a time when the child is striving for independence but is still tied to the parents. Teens, for many different reasons, begin to assert more independence at different ages. Decision-making abilities vary widely among teens in this age group, as well as from one situation to another. Teens often have outside interests that compete with the scheduled parenting plan. They frequently prefer to spend more time with their friends than their parents, and may become resentful or angry if they can't do what they want to do. Teens may try to reach a deal with one or both parents, to get what they want, which may affect either parent's parenting time. It's important for parents to talk with each other to decide when their parenting time should be more flexible. It's important for parents of teenagers of this age to help maintain the child's access to school, friends, extracurricular, and community activities from both homes. Teens feel they should have more independence and may resist a rigid parenting time schedule. Parents must add greater flexibility to the parenting plan by thinking about the child's wishes and deciding parenting time issues with the child. That way, teenagers won't feel forced to comply with a parenting schedule in which they had no say. Instead, they will feel like they are doing something they want to do. Your teen may benefit from a primary home base with specific evenings, weekends, and activities at the other home scheduled on a regular and predictable basis. More than anything, your teenager will usually want to say in the parenting plan, but the teen doesn't get to make the decisions. Regardless of your teen's needs, the parenting plan should include the following considerations. Your work 
and theirs, extracurricular activities, their social life, increased schoolwork, friendships, sports activities. Many teens prefer one primary home close to their friends and weekends or evenings with the other parent. Some will prefer a 50-50 plan with their parents. Much of this will depend on the history of the relationship with each parent, the distance between the parents' homes, and the parents' availability to meet their child's needs. True or false? Children will react the same way to separation and divorce, no matter what age they are. That is false. Now more than ever, your children are going to need your care, comfort, and consideration. You want to try to keep things as simple as possible right now so that they are not exposed to undue stress. They are going to experience a range of emotions and one of those most prevalent emotions is fear. We all have a fight or flight response in our brain. We have this system so that if we are in immediate danger, we can immediately respond, almost without thinking, to get ourselves to safety. This life-saving response is an amazing switch that is turned on to keep us safe. However, problems can occur if this switch doesn't get turned off. If we are in a constant state of fear or arousal, it can eventually take a toll on our health. And this is especially true for children who are exposed to trauma and conflict. Your children may start to act out, doing things like lying, stealing, hoarding, being aggressive, violent, or screaming. You may see an increase in hostile, angry, shameful, frustrated, or jealous behavior. If you start to see these behaviors, you will know that your child needs your immediate care, comfort, and consideration. Even though children know that they did not cause the divorce, they almost always feel as though they are somehow at fault. When I was young, I felt like it was my fault. Fighting, they're kind of fighting over you and what's going to happen with you between them. So it's kind of like you made it happen. I kind of knew it wasn't my fault in a way, but I still felt like it was kind of my issue just because I was their kid. At the first part of it, when my dad and my mom got divorced, yeah, I thought it was my fault, that it was me, that I did something. It feels like it is like the kid's fault because this never happened when you were like first born or you can see pictures of your parents before you were born and how happy they were together. And then like when the kids are born and stuff, everything just sort of went boom. It is completely normal to have strong feelings about what is happening in your family right now. Your children will have strong feelings as well. It is not uncommon to experience all of the stages of grief during this process. The stages of grief are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Grief is a very individual process and all individuals will go through it at their own pace. Give yourself the space to recognize you are going through these stages. It will be important for you to be aware that your children are going through these stages as well. Another thing to remember about grief is that we experience grief in a cycle. You will find that you go through all of these stages more than once before truly arriving at a long-term acceptance. The average length of this process in divorce is two years for adults and three years for children. When your family breaks up, it's almost like you've lost that other person that you're not living with anymore. It's like a death, two people splitting up and somebody got, le like they're leaving. And she hasn't even called us in like in 30, uh, 30 years, I think. I don't know. Like when your mom and dad get divorced, you don't really, really get to see a mom or your dad that much. He usually just comes over and gives us our child support money and then says, okay, bye, love you, and then goes with his girlfriend to the house. For adults, the denial stage can be as simple as acting like nothing is happening, going on with life as normal, and not paying attention to the signs that the relationship is coming to an end. For others, denial may be a sense of feeling numb or in shock. 
Others will be eternally optimistic that the problems can be worked out. For children, denial may manifest itself in an inability to think clearly and an increased number of mistakes. They too may feel in shock or numb. It is important to have patience with our children during this phase. During the anger phase, adults usually look for someone to blame for the breakup. It is usually the other parent, their significant other or in-laws. But anger can build towards friends and family and even the children. It is important to seek professional help if you feel that your anger is misguided and unmanageable. Children will also experience anger during this process, and it is possible the anger will be directed at you. They will most likely blame one parent or both for the breakup. Their behavior can manifest in acting out toward other people or friends, and they may struggle with behavior problems in school. During the bargaining stage, adults will start to look for ways to repair the relationship. They would rather do just about anything than go through the pain of the separation. Some people will begin to bargain with money or changes to child rearing or promises to change behaviors. Many last ditch efforts are made to get the old life back. For children, they will bargain with things like promises to behave and promises to keep their rooms clean if only their parents will reconcile. They will promise anything to help repair their parents' relationship. Adults may show depression in a number of different ways. Many will find it hard to sleep, have a loss of appetite, or overeat. Others will resort to drugs and alcohol use. Many will become short-tempered and easily agitated. Children will exhibit some of the same behaviors during the depression phase. You may notice a change in sleep patterns, eating patterns, or they may become withdrawn. It is important to seek professional help if these behaviors continue or become worse. I don't think my parents are aware of my needs because I don't think they've ever been put in the same situation or I've ever um, observed or had a family member that's been in the same situation. Their parents were always together and that's one thing that is really hard because your parents don't know what it's like. At some point, adults and children alike will reach the acceptance phase. At this phase, people begin to understand that there is a new normal and that their old life, the way they once knew it, will not return. But a new sense of hope begins to form as new traditions are made, new ideas and plans form, and all begin to accept the situation. I usually went to my room and then I would just kind of sit in, sit in there for a while. I just try to put it back behind in the back burner of my head and just try to push on through my life. I just put them aside and I'm, I'm trying to have a new life instead of that other life. You want to make sure that you are as healthy and strong as you can be during the time your case is pending because this sets a good example for your children and helps them. Remember even the basic things like getting good rest, eating healthy, and exercising. Think about the last time you rode on an airplane. The flight attendants always remind us that if for some reason the oxygen masks drop down from the ceiling, we need to first put our mask on and then help our neighbor. If we don't take care of ourselves first, we are no good to anyone else. Remember the same is true of your children. You need to first take care of your basic needs to make sure that you can be there for your children when they need you. Name the five stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. Our experts, the kids themselves, repeatedly tell us that conflict between parents is the very most devastating part of divorce. Indeed, virtually all adult experts in the field of divorce adjustment agree. The hardest part that I remember was going through the fighting. The hardest part of divorce is when they fight. I wish that 
everything would be back to normal, no more fighting, and our dad coming home instead of getting a divorce. I made that dad made mom move out. Instead of showing love to each other, they show animosity, and like they really don't like each other. And I don't think they try and hide it as much as they should. Me and my brother, we had this staircase that leads right up to the living room. And we would just sit there and watch them from around the corner when they were yelling at each other. When my mom and my stepdad used to fight, I would take my sister into my room or I would, I would never try to get in between it and say, can you please leave? But I would take her and we would go in my room and we would talk and try to ignore them as much as possible. But when my birth mom and my birth dad would fight, I just, I didn't have somebody to lean on and talk to. The hardest thing for me was the part when she left my dad. It didn't feel good at all. And I asked her where we were going and she didn't tell me. My parents just kept fighting and my brother and my mom's relationship kind of grew apart. So that was tough for me and him. <laughs> If I could ask my dad anything, it would be, why do you leave? You know, sometimes they're talking on the phone and they get into a fight and they just end up so angry and they hang up. And, you know, sometimes they take the anger out on the people around them. And it's, it's hard. It's hard on my little sister. Conflict occurs on a continuum, and all relationships have some degree of conflict. It is inevitable. Children, however, are negatively impacted by seeing, hearing, or otherwise experiencing parental conflict. Children who experience long-term domestic violence are the most severely impacted. Whether verbal or physical, domestic violence can have a devastating effect on children. And you may think that you are able to shield your children from what is going on, but children understand and know about much more than we think they do. They have eyes and ears that are keenly aware of the situation, and even if they are not present when the actual violence takes place, they will see the aftermath of it. Remember that your children are learning from you how to conduct a relationship. There may be times when you need to get law enforcement involved in your dissolution or separation situation. For example, if you are in an unsafe situation, you are a victim of domestic violence, or if your children have not been returned after an excessive amount of time, it is very important to know when it is appropriate to call the police. Please do not call the police because the other parent forgot to bring your child's pajamas back. Do not call the police if the other parent is 10 minutes late picking up or dropping off the children. Do not call the police with every grievance you have against the other party. If you are having trouble with the other parent following the parenting plan, keep track of what is going on and let the court know what is happening by filing a petition or a motion. Another very harmful behavior is called parental alienation. This happens when a parent tries to basically pull the children to their side by speaking ill of the other parent, keeping them away from the other parent and not allowing parenting time, or putting ideas into the children's minds that create doubt or anger against the other parent. And unfortunately, quite often this behavior extends beyond the parent causing the alienation to that parent's extended family and friends. It can become a mob mentality and your children have no escape. Every family member or friend they spend time with is tearing down the other parent. And while the children may not say anything, it can hurt them very deeply. Remember your children are half your ex-spouse. And when you or other people make disparaging remarks about the other parent, your child believes those same things about themselves since they are part of the other parent. You have full control to make sure this type of behavior does not exist and that your child is not exposed to it. 
And if you become aware that family or friends are causing parental alienation, you need to have a discussion immediately with them to make sure that it stops. It was, it kind of became a battle between, you know, mom bashing on dad and dad bashing on mom and us kids in the middle of it. And, um, I mean, it still goes on to this day, so <laughs> it was always a lot of pressure. Once when dad was about to be at chess, I just I cried. I don't know how, where should I move? It's hard if you want to balance your time out with your parents and equally and stuff. That's kind of hard to do. Or if you want to spend more time with, a little bit more time with one parent than the other, that's pretty tough because you don't want to hurt the other parent's feelings and all of that <laughs> not so great stuff. I don't want them fighting at each other because I love them both. They shouldn't like talk about each other behind each other's backs. Because sometimes they do that, just like you're acting just like your mother, or you're you're acting just like your father, and it's it's sort of like making us take sides. If you believe you're in an abusive relationship, now may be the time to think about ways to make yourself safer. You need to think ahead of ways to keep yourself and your children safe. Here are just a few tips. Leave or stay away from the kitchen or any other room with weapons. Stay out of rooms that do not have exits, like bathrooms or closets. If possible, get to a room with an exit and or a phone. Develop a code word or signal for friends, children, and neighbors to call the police. Call 911 or the local emergency number. Teach your children to call 911 in an emergency. Use your instincts. It is a good idea to have a support system you can rely on during this time. Think of friends, family, churches, or organizations you can go to in a time of crisis. If you do not have a support system, check with your local court to obtain phone numbers for shelters and support in your area. Suicide can be a thought that can go through a lot of people's minds in a time like this. The fear and anxiety can become overwhelming Check with your local court for hotline numbers and ways you can get help if you are feeling this way. Also lean into your support system as much as possible. Know that there are scores of people and agencies available to help. Do not give up. But what should you do if you're concerned your child may be having these thoughts? You may start to see signs like your child withdrawing from friends and regular activities. You may see increased signs of depression or notice that your child is giving away their possessions. If you have a concern that your child may be contemplating suicide, the first thing you can do is simply ask them the question, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Research shows that simply asking the question and creating the opportunity for dialogue will quite often interrupt any thoughts the person had about committing suicide. Next, you want to get them some help. Check with your child's school for any resources they may have for counseling or help. Use your local court as a resource. The law library should have a list of resources and or local counselors a hotline in your area or take your child to their physician. The point is to get them help as soon as possible. The worst thing you can do is pretend the problem does not exist and ignore it. You do not want to wait until it's too late. Let's talk about some healthy ways that you can help your children deal with trauma and feelings. First, have your children tell you what they're feeling. Are they feeling mad, sad, glad, or angry? You can help them by doing this yourself. In an age-appropriate and calm way, you can tell them about some of your feelings. You can also point out other people's feelings on TV or while reading to your children. Getting into a pattern of identifying feelings helps to open up healthy conversations. Next, validate your children's feelings. This means letting them know that what they're feeling is okay. Their feelings are not right or wrong and will not last forever. Even feelings like anger and sadness are not bad. It is just how we deal with them that can be hurtful. You want to encourage the expression of feelings and show compassion for them. You may say things like, 
Seems like you're feeling angry. And what is it about? Don't try to force them to feel any different than how they actually feel. If they don't want to talk to you, ask why. Ask if they're trying to protect you or feel you can't handle what they have to say. Assure them that they can tell you anything. Redirect your children by teaching them healthy expressions of their feelings. Encourage your children to go outside and kick a soccer ball rather than yelling at or pushing their younger sibling. Children may need to vent with action or activity before they are able to talk about their feelings with you. Teach children how to soothe themselves when feeling bad. They can learn to nurture themselves by taking walks or imagining their favorite color, song, or a dream they have for the future. If you're a religious or a spiritual family, try using those principles. Help your child to know that someone or something bigger than you is helping look out for your family. And finally, teach your children to let go and not hold on to grudges. Teach them that when they let go of hurts, they're doing a favor for themselves. I think that kids learn to be grown-ups from their parents. So if you don't have your parents, then it's definitely a lot harder. I think when parents fight in front of their kids, it's not being a good role model because that shows the kids that if they have a problem that with someone else that they don't like, they should fight about it. Like we would fight with our brothers or we were just not the best bunch. When parents aren't showing that they are working out too much, the kid often feels hurt and confused about what's going on. When my mom did better, I did better. Just as there are healthy ways of helping your children deal with trauma, there are also some very destructive ways of dealing with your children's trauma and feelings. Let's take a look at a few of these destructive behaviors so you can make sure you avoid them. First, make sure that you do not shame your child's feelings by saying things like, oh, grow up, be a man, or don't act like a baby. Remember that your children are going through a range of emotions and these emotions will come and go in waves. Do not ignore your children's feelings. Pretending that nothing is going on could lead to worse or more destructive behavior. Do not criticize your children's feelings. Telling them you shouldn't feel that way or that's not the right feeling to have is not helpful. The fact of the matter is, that is how they are feeling right now and it is up to you to help them through those feelings. Do not teach your children to stuff their feelings and move on. Over time, this can have a devastating effect on their emotional and physical well-being. Expressing feelings is always the healthiest option. Do not be a bully, act grandiose, or play super cool. These behaviors can be intimidating to children and make them feel inferior. Do not create a crisis to get attention. Your children do not need to be exposed to dramatic arguments, drinking, drug use, or any other crisis that may cause them more worry and anxiety. Not being emotionally available for your children is a destructive behavior as well. Having an attitude that feeding and clothing your children should be enough does nothing for their emotional well-being. Your children need to know that you truly care about them. And finally, do not run away or get stuck in the victim mode or in a cycle of hatred or depression. As hard as it may be for you, your children need you to be strong and not give up. While conflict may be inevitable in this process, you can still be as prepared as possible to handle it when it arises. Think of the other parent now as a business partner. How would you conduct a business meeting in order to achieve certain goals? Let's take a look at a few ideas. First, State the problem, not the solution. Don't feel the pressure to come up with an immediate answer and make sure that you're not tied to only your solution. Keep an open mind to hear what the other parent has to say. Next, conduct a business meeting. Meet the other parent at a mutually convenient, neutral location. Sit down and have an agenda of items you would like to discuss. It's a good idea to start with an item you think you may be able to easily resolve first and then move on to the harder issues. Be aware of your emotional baggage. 
Know your triggers and the things that upset you. You may want to write those things down ahead of time so that they're fresh in your mind when you sit down for your meeting and you can combat the urge to argue or the impulse to fight. Next, remember to use I messages when trying to communicate with the other parent. For example, I feel really frustrated when the children are not returned on time. Rather than accusing and blaming the other parent by saying, you never bring the kids back on time, if you can frame your statements in a way that reflects your feelings and takes out the blame, the other parent might be more likely to hear and understand what you're saying. Think about writing down your grievances as I messages before your meeting so that you don't have to come up with them on the spot. And finally, use paraphrasing when speaking with the other parent. This means that you repeat back to them what you hear them say. Repeating back what you understood them to say and what you both agree to helps ensure that you are both on the same page and that no misunderstandings remain. While developing your parenting plan, keep in mind the following tips that can be a real benefit to your children in the future. Children benefit when parents help their children have regular contact with the other parent by phone, letter, FaceTime, Skype, email, and other forms of communication. Keep predictable schedules. Be on time and have the children ready when it's time to go with the other parent. Exchange the children without any arguing. Support your children's relationship with the other parent. Let your children carry important items such as favorite clothes, toys, and security blankets with them between the parents' homes. Follow similar routines for meals, homework, and bedtime. Handle rules and discipline in similar ways. Support contact with grandparents, step-parents, and other extended family so the children don't lose those relationships. Be flexible so the children can take part in special family celebrations and events. Give as much advance notice as possible to the other parent about special occasions or necessary changes to the schedule. Provide the other parent with travel dates, destinations, and places where the children and you can be reached while on vacation. Establish workable and respectful communication with the other parent. Plan your vacations around the children's scheduled activities. Remember that children can be harmed when parents make their children choose between them, question their children about the other parents' activities or relationships, make promises that they don't keep, drop in and out of the children's lives, are inconsistent in using their parenting time, argue with or put down the other parent in front of the children or where the children can overhear, discuss their personal problems with the children or where the children can overhear, use the children as messengers, spies, or mediators, Stop or interfere with parenting time because child support has not been paid. Do not show respect for each other. Undermine the children's relationship with the other parent. Let's talk for a bit about personal responsibility and personal empowerment. We have already determined this can be a tough time, and it is so important to remember that no two families are alike. Each situation will present unique challenges and opportunities. So have you had time to think about what you want to handle the situation? Have you thought of ways you can be empowered? Ways you can show personal responsibility? Even if the divorce is out of your control, you are still accountable for your decisions, how you respond, and your actions. 
in managing this situation as best you can, and all the while you are modeling that behavior for your children. Consider developing your own pause button. Practice staying calm in stressful or upsetting situations, and this does take practice. Sometimes we can anticipate that we might be entering into an upsetting conversation or situation, and sometimes they take us by surprise. Remember the pause button. Practice thinking before you speak. Another good idea is to wait 24 hours before making a decision or responding to something that has angered you. Remember to hit pause before you react. Ask yourself the question, what am I trying to accomplish here? While you may not have control of the entire situation, you are completely in control of how you respond to it. And that helps you build personal empowerment. By having the power over your own emotions, you are better able to navigate the rough waters that may lie ahead. If you find that you are having a hard time communicating with your co-parent, consider having a business meeting to discuss ideas or changes you would like to make. Prepare for the meeting just as you would a business meeting. You would want to give advance notice of the place and time for the meeting. Next, you would schedule the meeting at a neutral location that works for both parties and is safe. A place like the mall or a restaurant would be a good place. Next, have an agenda ready with topics you would like to discuss and make certain you stick to these topics. And, as you would in a business meeting, keep your emotions in check and remain calm as you navigate through the items on your agenda. A student a long time ago gave me a great tip that she uses when discussing the children with her ex-husband. She said she makes a conscious effort to refer to the children as our children in every conversation. By not referring to my daughter or my son, and instead talking about our children, it took some of the animosity away from the situation. Dad didn't feel on the defense that he had to fight for his children, but instead came into every conversation knowing that both parents were working in the best interest of their children. Another way of looking at conflict and solutions is to come up with a problem-solving paradigm. This can happen when parents sit down together and first state what the problem is. Next, you can list all the possible solutions to that problem. Some will be your solution, some will be the other parents. This is a chance to brainstorm and just write everything down, no matter how silly. Then together you come up with the best solution or two. Then you pick the one that you both believe will work best and just let the others go. It may not be the solution you had in mind when you first sat down, but remember to keep an open mind for negotiation and just make sure it is a solution you can both live with. Communication is essential for co-parenting. For many years to come, and on an ongoing basis, you will need to exchange information about your children with the other parent. To avoid problems, parents should provide parenting information to one another. Practice the ACT method and that information should be accurate, complete, and timely. Even if the court has restricted your contact with the other parent, you will still need to regularly exchange information about your children. You will need to exchange it in such a way that is consistent with the court's orders. Parents may not always agree about which parent has the right to certain information. If you are in doubt, follow the golden rule. Always provide the other parent information that you expect that parent to give to you. Here's an example of two people who want to be good parents but are not good at communicating with each other. They do not follow either one of the best practices of co-parenting communication. Mother and father have one child, Maria, who just turned five. They have joint legal decision making with week on, week off, equal parenting time. They do not practice good co-parenting communication. Maria will start kindergarten in August and the school requires her to be immunized before she starts. During father's assigned week in late July, he takes Maria to his selected pediatrician, Dr. Smith, for her immunizations. He does not tell mother what he has done. 
Then he sends the immunization records to Maria's new school. During Mother's Next Assigned Week, she takes Maria to her selected pediatrician, Dr. Jones, where Maria gets the same immunizations a second time. Mother does not inform father and sends the immunization records to Maria's school. When school starts, the nurse sees both records and realizes that Maria received the immunizations twice. Neither parent intended to harm their child. They each wanted to follow the school rules. However, getting the child immunized twice, especially so close together, was clearly not in her best interest. Even though neither parent intended to harm Maria, they both put her at risk by failing to inform one another about Maria's immunizations. Parents want to do what's best for their children. They do not intend to do something that may harm or hurt them. But if they do not exchange information, their children may be harmed. Sharing information is always the best practice. The previous example showed what may happen when there is no communication between parents. If parents use poor communication skills or communicate in a hurtful or angry way, it can also be bad for the children. Use the following list of tips to guide and improve your co-parenting communication. Keep your focus. Be brief, to the point, and stay focused on your child. Stay focused on the present or future events. Don't bring up past problems or situations. Be positive and use a business-like tone. Remember the reason for your communication. You are passing on information to the other parent. Keep your cool. Don't jump to conclusions or overreact. Don't write in all capital letters to make a point. This can give the impression that you are angry. Don't criticize, blame, or accuse the other parent. If some of your sentences begin with, you always or you never, you have slipped back into blaming or an angry tone about the other parent. You need to switch your focus back to your child. Don't make rude, mean, or sarcastic comments about the other parent. Don't make demands. Don't use profanity. Keep it courteous and cooperative. Do provide the other parent with reasonable deadlines and due dates. Do use courteous and respectful words such as please and thank you. Be cooperative. Write the communication as if someone such as a judge or other decision maker will read it. Cooperating with your co-parent says your child is your first priority. My dad shows me he cares about me by calling me every night. And if he can't get a hold of me because I'm busy, he texts me and leaves me a message. My mom set up an email thing for me and so I can write letters to him and stuff. For the kids' sake, help them get through it. Ask if they have any questions. Tell them it wasn't their fault. I know my mom would do anything for me when it comes down to it. She, uh, she tries her hardest. I know we're all stressed and everything, but she tries her hardest just to talk to me and to come home and make dinner. Or... I know we butt heads a lot, but she loves me. The things that my parents have done to help me adjust to the divorce is they first bought me a bunch of books and they read them to me like it's not my fault and stuff. Parents could help more by uh, talking to us and telling us more that's going on and having alone time without like your sisters or your brothers and just helping us and if we need to cry, help us cry. and. It may not always be possible for parents to communicate face-to-face -face for a number of reasons. In those instances, the use of email, texting, or telephone calls may be more appropriate. Let's take a look at each of these communication tools. Email communication is quick and effective. It allows you to create a true record of your communication. Your parenting plan may include the use of email to contact the other parent about your child. Your plan may include a special time frame that requires you to respond to an email, even if it is just to acknowledge that you have received it. Your communication plan may specify that you file or print all exchanged emails or keep an email notebook for future reference 
or future litigation. Here are some helpful tips to remember when emailing your co-parent. Limit email to one topic. Keep email brief, such as one paragraph with five sentences. Keep the email focused on sharing information about present or future activities or about a developing problem. Keep the focus of the email on the child or children. Say something once and don't repeat yourself. Use respectful language, no abusive, sarcastic, or insulting words, no profanity. Respond to an email in a timely manner with 24 hours of when it was sent. Each parent should send no more than two emails per day unless there is an emergency. Emails should be sent between the two parents instead of a step-parent or significant other to a parent. Texting allows you and the other parent to quickly exchange basic information. However, if there is a disagreement, texting may not provide a true record of your communication. Sometimes technological problems or an uncharged phone battery may prevent timely deliver of text messages. If a parent and child exchange frequent text messages during the co-parent's custodial time, the co-parent may not welcome or appreciate this texting. It may seem to intrude on the co-parent's time with the child. Unless there is a specific reason to restrict direct contact, the telephone can be an important and useful tool to communicate with the other parent. However, regular telephone communication should be used only if you and the other parent have been able to communicate without conflict starting. You may want to set a time for telephone calls, for example, between 6.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Some families limit telephone calls to five minutes each, one call per day. Parents should use respectful language when communicating with one another. A good rule to follow is to write and speak as if someone else besides the co-parent will read or hear the communication. Remember, no name calling, no nicknames, and no abusive language. The Child News Report is a great way to help parents easily share basic information. This communication tool works something like a progress report between a teacher and a parent. The Child News Report can be as simple as a notebook that travels with the child to each parent's home. The notebook with a binding are better than loose leaf pages or a spiral notebook. The notebook is an inexpensive tool that does not require the use of any technology. There are some disadvantages of using a notebook instead of technology. A notebook can be lost, changed, or destroyed. Your child could read it. The notebook may not be effective in dealing with time-sensitive issues. This can be especially true during longer blocks of parenting time. So how do you use this tool? At or near the end of your parenting time with your child, Begin a new dated entry in the notebook and write down information about your time with the child. The information you write in your child's news report will depend on the child's age. Include details about medical care, serious injuries or illnesses, diet, education, school events or major social events, and upcoming appointments. You should also include any issues that may come up for your child while they were in your care that need to have further discussion. After the child's exchange, the other parent should read and initial the news entry in the notebook. Then, at the end of their parenting time, this parent will write down an entry and send the notebook along with the child. The news report for infants and toddlers might include things like feeding, nap and sleeping schedules, ways to soothe and calm the child, how bumps and bruises occurred, potty training techniques and updates, moods, medical appointments, illness and medication, developmental milestones. A child news report for preschool and school-aged children might include relationships with friends and social activities, school, extracurricular, and religious activities, scheduled events and activities, homework and school projects, school progress, behavioral and disciplinarian issues, bed,
bath and meal routines. I guess my mom thinks about it and like she tries to show like love in a different way for it but it's like no I don't really need that I want to talk about it. I think they care about all three of us a lot because um, since the divorce I think that brought more caring into it because they wanted to make sure that we were happy but didn't like worry about the whole situation. They care about me. I mean, she's, my mom has always done what's best for me. Um, and my dad is learning too. The hardest thing to get used to is that no matter what, your parents will not be together anymore and you're always gonna have to live at separate houses if you wanna see them both. Janet? Like, mom and dad won't get back together again. I you know. It's really painful in the heart, and, like, it'll hurt for a little while. And then once you get used to it, you, you, you'll you get to see your dad a lot more. My dad would play, my stepdad plays, like, sports with me. Like, sometimes he'll show me, like, like, like he showed me how to throw a football, and like, I did pretty good at that. I would say divorce is not a bad thing. I mean, it's not, you obviously don't want it to happen, but in a lot of ways it makes it better. The whole family is just a lot happier, and I would say just, you'll get through it. I mean, it may be hard at the beginning, but it'll all turn out good in the end. I feel like divorce is a two-sided coin, and on one side it's very negative and very, harmful and hurtful and um, on the other side though I feel like it's made me a stronger person and it's made me wiser. Um, it's made me really think about who I want to be and how I want to present myself to other people and the decisions that I'm going to make in my future that I'm starting to make now as an 18 year old. and. Um, I think that those things are really positive. If you can get the right help and go in the right direction, it's definitely a positive thing. Given that this can be an emotional time for families, it is sometimes easy to forget that parents and children have rights in this process. Unless ordered differently by the court, parents have the following rights. You have the right to be a part of your child's life. You have the right to communicate with your children by phone and by letter and to send packages. You have the right to regular scheduled visitations or time periods with your child. You have the right to make the decisions for your child when your child is with you. That means that during your scheduled time with the child, the child care you choose is up to you. It also means that you decide whose company your child will share during your time. You have a right to copies of your child's school and medical records. This will be mentioned in the parenting plan formed during mediation. You have the right to set the rules in your own home, such as bedtimes, etc. It is best if parents can harmonize the rules as much as possible in both homes, but when disagreements exist about child raising techniques, this is not always possible. Children adjust to things being different at each home, just as they adjust to different rules at school and home. Now let's talk about the rights that your children have. When talking to your children, let them know they have the following rights unless ordered differently by the court. Children have the right to see and spend time with both of their parents. Children have the right to call or send a letter to either one of their parents. Children have a right to own their own feelings and a right to tell people what their feelings are. Children have a right to not be used as a messenger between their parents. Children have the right to love both of their parents. Children have the right to not be forced to choose between parents or in which home they will live. Even after your final decree has been signed, you may find that you're still struggling with the effects of the dissolution or separation. 
There are a number of resources available online and through your local law library. Consider getting some counseling from a licensed counselor or therapist. Seek support through your church or community groups. Remember, these feelings won't last forever and that you are growing every day. If you find that you're having trouble with your parenting plan in the future or things have changed to the point that revisions need to be made, you can always come back to mediation even after your decree has been signed. Thank you for taking this opportunity to learn more about how the dissolution process works in Arizona. Most importantly, thank you for taking the time to consider ways in which you can help your children through this process. We are confident that if you keep your children's best interest at heart, you will be able to navigate this process with ease. As I told you at the beginning, your child or children will keep you in contact with the other parent throughout your lives. The time to start making that relationship a positive one is now. We wish you and your family all the best in the months and years to come. Our kids aren't shy at all about telling us what the rules should be for divorcing parents. I would say a don't for parents is don't fight in front of your kids no matter what because that really affects them no matter how old they are. But maybe if I could tell them anything, I would tell them just, just don't talk bad about the other person. That really makes me mad. In the beginning, they would not talk. Like They didn't talk for like a month. And they were trying to go through me. And I was like, no, you're not going through me. Talk to the other person. Don't talk about things that aren't related to the kids in front of them that are related to the divorce, um, such as um, child support money and things like that. Kids don't want to hear that. Make sure the kid knows that it's not their fault. It's a big one. To be open with their kids and like explain everything to them. I think that something on the do list would definitely be that you should try to be a part of your kid's life even though you're separated. Always reassure your kid that you're there for them no matter how they, you know, the parents feel about the situation, the kids should come first, always. Thank you.